<laughs> so, as MC, I need to introduce the speakers, so I'd like to introduce the first speaker today, and this is someone who I've gotten to know pretty well over the years. So I'm very happy to introduce him to you now. He's, he's a little strange, <laughs> but he's really excited to be here today. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Tom Price. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, that was the uh, best introduction I've ever received. I'm very <laughs> pleased to have done that. And as the MC said, uh, I'm very happy to be here today <laughs> and to speak to you on the subject of the five-year plan. In fact, I have three sessions all on the subject of the five-year plan, and I'm really excited about that. I can't think of any subject more thrilling and exciting and stimulating than this. And so I thank the school committee for uh, asking me to do this because it forced me to have to really read the messages of the House of Justice and to understand the five-year plan. So let's go ahead and start this first session. The title of the talk today is The Organic Process of the Five-Year Plan. And I'd like to begin in the year 1919. In that year, 1919, the American nation was reeling from the devastation of the greatest war the world had ever seen. In fact, some 40 million people had died during that war. And immediately upon the end of the war, the world was plunged into the deadliest natural disaster, one of the deadliest natural disasters in human history, a flu pandemic that killed more than 100 million people, more than twice as many people than the war killed, died in the two years after the war from this flu pandemic. The world was completely reeling from all of this and they struggled to try to make sense of it, tried to form a League of Nations which failed. The world was in more turmoil than had ever existed perhaps in human history in this year 1919. And in that year the small American Baha'i community received a set of letters from Abdu'l Baha. Now Abdu'l Baha wrote these letters when he was old and weary. He had just finished a long three-year international travels, a lifetime of imprisonment, and he was very near the end of his earthly life. And he wrote these letters addressed to the Baha'is of North America, to Canada and the United States. Some of them were addressed to all of the Baha'is of North America, and some were addressed to certain states, uh, the southern states, the western states, and so on. They had actually been written during the war in 1916 and 1917, and some had been published in Star of the West, but they were completely unveiled first at a conference in 1919. Today we know of these letters as the tablets of the divine plan. But to speak of them only as the tablets of the divine plan doesn't do them justice. Shoghi Effendi had many, many ways of describing these. For example, in one place Shoghi Effendi said that they were Abdu'l Baha's spiritual mandate. In another passage, he said they were Abdu'l Baha's unique and grand design. And in another passage, he said they were the weightiest spiritual enterprise launched in recorded history. Can you believe that? The weightiest spiritual enterprise launched in recorded history. Shoghi Effendi talked about the Baha'is who carry out the tablets of the divine plan. And he said that those Baha'is were, quote, the privileged recipients of epoch-making tablets the one in whose hands providence had placed a key with which they would unlock the door leading them to an unimaginably glorious destiny. And quoting Abdu'l Baha, Shoghi Effendi said that those Baha'is who faithfully carry out the tablets of the divine plan would be established on the throne of an everlasting dominion and that the whole earth would resound with their praises and the majesty of their greatness. Shoghi Fendi said that these tablets of the divine plan, these letters that Abdu'l Baha wrote, he said they were part of three mighty charters that we have in the faith. And these three charters, he said, set in motion processes and released spiritual powers into the world. Those three charters are the tablet of Carmel of Baha'u'llah, the will and testament of Abdu'l Baha, and the tablets of the divine plan. The first of these charters set in motion the uh, entire development of the Baha'i World Center, 
The second, the will and testament of Abdu'l-Bahá set in motion the erection of the Baha'i administration. And the third of these charters, the tablets of the divine plan, concerned the spiritual conquest of the hearts of men by teaching and proclaiming the faith to every spot on the planet. But all of these descriptions I just told you came from Shoghi Effendi, who in 1919 wasn't the guardian. So I wonder what the Baha'is in 1919 thought when they first received these letters. In fact, I like to think, what would it have been like had I been a Baha'i in 1919 and I received these letters from Abdu'l Baha? How would I have responded had I first read them? Would I have been like, say, John Henry Hyde Dunn, who was sitting at his home in Santa Cruz, California, and his wife Clara was reading these letters aloud. And she came to the part where Adibaha said he longed to travel, even though on foot and in the utmost poverty. And something struck her about the phrase utmost poverty. And she turned to her husband and she said, we are almost in poverty. Let us go where Adibaha wished to go. And Hyde immediately replied, okay, let's go. And they immediately decided to board a ship for Australia, where at the time there wasn't a single soul who knew of the faith. He was 62 years old. Isn't that amazing? He was 62 years old. And when they arrived in Sydney, he didn't have a penny in his pocket. He said, we arrived in Sydney with naught but faith in Abdu'l Baha. Now, many of the Baha'is in California were so concerned that a poor and elderly couple would do this that they tried to talk them out of it. But Hyde said he would sooner die than not respond to Abdu'l Baha's call. Shoghi Effendi would later designate them as hands of the cause of God and called them conquerors of a continent and pointed out that their swift response to these tablets made them the only Baha'is in history to have arrived at their international post before the passing of the master. So I wonder if I would have been able to respond like the Duns did, to immediately receive a message from the head of the faith and to respond so quickly. Or perhaps could I have been like Martha Root, who received the letters, read them, and immediately embarked on a travel teaching trip, a series of travel teaching trips that lasted for 20 years. She went around the world more than four times she went to every continent, to Asia, Africa, Central America, Pacific Islands, Europe. She even enrolled the first monarch into the faith. Now remember, it wasn't easy to travel in the 1920s, you, not like it is today. And yet she was also in her 50s and 60s during her travels, very advanced in age. She continued to travel right up until her passing in 1939 while she was still traveling. I wonder if I might have been able to respond like she did. If I were alive in 1919, received these letters from Abdu'l Baha, would I have been able to respond as she did? If a message came from the head of the faith with a weighty mission and a high calling, would I have been able to recognize it as quickly as she did? Now I want to cut to the year 1939. We're going to move ahead by 20 years. In that year, the American nation was trying to recover from the Great Depression. And it was only just a few months before the outbreak of even another war, deadlier than the First World War, a war that was going to kill 70 million people. And it amidst all kinds of international upheavals, military, political, economic, in other words, in a time of even greater instability and uncertainty than 20 years before, in that year, 1939, the American Baha'is received a letter from Shoghi Effendi. The House of Justice said that this letter was of considerable length and great potency. In fact, it was later published as a book entitled The Advent of Divine Justice. But at the time, it was just a letter addressed to each and every American Baha'i. Can you imagine going to your mailbox in 1939 <laughs> and you say, oh, here's the letter from Shoghi Effendi. Let's see what's inside it. And you open it up and it's 77 pages long. That's what it was. And in that letter, Shoghi Effendi described a mission that the American Baha'is had to carry out, which was the first seven-year plan. It, in fact, it had started a year earlier. It went from 1937 to 1944. And this mission was the first plan of the Guardian. 
he said some very interesting things about this first plan. He said the tablets of the divine plan that Adabahad sent in 1919 were not finished. He said that the new seven-year plan that he was launching was part of Adabahad's divine plan. And not only that, but the divine plan would not even be finished when we finished this seven-year plan. He said this, the new seven-year plan is the opening scene of the first act of that supreme drama whose theme is no less than the spiritual conquest of both the Eastern and Western hemispheres. He said this seven-year plan that he launched was a mere beginning as a trial of strength, a stepping stone to a crusade of still greater magnitude. He said that the tablets of the divine plan had been held in abeyance for 20 years while the Baha'is first had to establish their basic administration. Now, beginning in 1937, it was time to begin systematically carrying out the divine plan. Now it was time, Shoghi Fendi said, for every single provision of that divine charter to be carried out. He said the seven-year plan is but the initial stage, a stepping stone to the unfoldment of the implications of this charter. And from that time on, from 1937 until today, we've had plans. The Guardian launched three plans during his lifetime, and the House of Justice subsequently has launched eight more plans leading up to today, and when we have this current plan, which is the five-year plan. Not all of the plans had exactly the same aims and objectives. The House of Justice says that each plan was suited to specific historical circumstances, but all of them are part of the unfoldment of Adi Baha's divine plan. Now, I want to move forward to eight months ago. Okay, I'm moving pretty fast through history, okay? <laughs> Just eight months ago. Late December last year, I went to my email inbox and I found a message had come from the House of Justice. It was addressed to the Continental Boards of Counselors, but sent for study to all of the Baha'is in the world. And I began to read it. And for the first time, I no longer had to wonder what it would have been like in 1939 to have received a message from Shoghi Effendi. And I no longer had to wonder what it would have been like in 1919 to read the message of Radha Baha. Now, why did I suddenly feel this way after reading that message from the House of Justice of 28 December? Shouldn't I have always felt the same way when any time a message came from the head of the faith? But there was something particular about this message that came 28 December, something that was said in it the way it was said that caused a connection in my mind to those early historic turning points in the faith. Before we even look at the content of this message, let's consider an interesting fact. The message itself is 24 pages long. You all know that, right? You've all been reading it. It takes over an hour and 15 minutes just to read aloud, because I, I tried it. It takes an hour and 15 just to read aloud. And in the same year, they had already sent a Rezvan message, which was 16 pages. That was the longest single Rezvan message the house had ever written. So go back and check. It was the longest message. And now we received another message, another Rezvan message from the house. In the space of one year, if you look at the book that's published called The Five-Year Plan that has basically these three letters, it's, let me see, it's 68 pages long. 68 pages long in just a year. So the flood of guidance that has recently come from the House of Justice is comparable in length to the Guardian's Advent of Divine Justice or Adi Baha's Tabas of Divine Plan. Now, I'm not suggesting that a long message is necessarily better or more important than a shorter one, but sometimes there are critical stages in the development of the faith, turning points that require us to grasp new ideas, to head in new directions and acquire new abilities. <laughs> And during these critical turning points, we can expect a greater volume of guidance and information. Even before we examine the content of the message, just the mere length of what the House of Justice is saying, it's kind of like they're saying, sit down, we need to talk. That's really what they're saying. Shoghi Effendi could have said it in 1939. He could have written a cable, sit down, we need to talk. I'm going to send you a 77-page letter. And, <laughs> Abdu Baha could have said the same thing in, in 1919. Sit down, we really need to talk. Because just the mere fact of the length of the message. If your boss came up to you and said, sit down, we need to talk. And if you said, okay, go ahead. And then the boss said, no, 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 we have to have an all-day meeting. Well, even before you know what he's going to say, 
you know something is afoot. You know, you know something big is about to happen. So, what did the House of Justice say in this message of 28 December? First, they tell us that this new five-year plan, which begins this year, 2011, and will continue to 2016, they said it's part of a 25-year period in the history of the faith. The 25-year period, they said, began in 1996 and will finish in 2021. The conclusion of this 25-year period will come at the centenary of Adabaha's passing and the conclusion of the first century of the formative age of the faith. So in the context of this 25-year period, right now, we're at a point where we're looking back by 15 years and forward by 10 years. That's where we stand. There have already been four plans in this 25-year period, a four-year plan, 12-month plan, and two other five-year plans. And now there'll be two more five-year plans to take us through the last 10 years of this period. I think historians will come to view this 25-year period as unprecedented, a period of profound transformation, not just in the history of the faith, but even in the history of mankind, especially in the history of religion. Things never before achieved by organized religion will be seen to have been born and evolved during this period. In the past, religions have been organized and administered by priests and ministers and rabbis and mullahs and gurus and so forth. And while the faith has never had a professional clergy, nevertheless, the habits of human thinking over thousands of years about what religion is and the way it should be administered has naturally led us to think along the lines of past models. So in a way, we may have unwittingly had de facto mullahs or priests, or at least a small band of administrators who we think have the responsibility for the spiritual health of a huge mass of followers. Well, this has all changed. The entire way which the word of God flows from the manifestation into the hearts of every human being, the very channels and mechanisms for this flow have been reinvented during this 25-year phase. The way in which the word of God interacts and affects society, transforming individuals, altering institutions, inspiring and giving life to communities, all of this is entirely new and unprecedented in the history of the world. Now, you may say, I'm exaggerating here. You think I'm exaggerating? Well, let me read something that the House of Justice says. They said, at the outset of this 25-year period, way back 15 years ago, they said, as they launched the very first plan, they said, the next four years will represent an extraordinary period in the history of our faith, a turning point of epochal magnitude. In the Resvan message of 1996, they said, this plan acquires a special place in the scheme of Baha'i and world history. Notice they said the plan is not just special in Baha'i history, even in world history. I particularly like the phrase, turning point of epochal magnitude. I think I just like saying the word epochal. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an interesting word. It means we've begun a whole new epoch, a distinct new period in human history. So, what happened in 1996 that marked this turning point of epochal magnitude? Well, in that year, 1996, the House launched a four-year plan, and they said something that kind of surprised a lot of us. They said the new plan would have just one aim, just a single accomplishment. And we said, oh, well, that's good. The last plan had seven aims. <laughs> this one should be a breeze if it only has one aim. And they said that this one major accomplishment was to achieve a significant advance in the process of entry by troops. Now, what did that mean exactly? The phrase entry by troops was familiar to us because the Guardian had used it, particularly in a message in 1953, in which he described three stages the faith would go through in its growth. These stages were first a steady flow of new believers, followed by entry by troops, and that would be followed by mass conversion. Now these are my words because in fact the Guardian never used the word stage to describe them. He just said the faith would go through these three things, from steady flow to entry by troops to mass conversion. We didn't know how long these would last. 
When they would occur, we just knew that they would go to them. However, we might have imagined that entry by troops was something that would just happen when certain conditions in the world caused it or something like that. We also might have thought that entry by troops would be a sudden event. You know, like you open the door and everybody enters. The House of Justice explained that it wasn't like that at all. Entry by troops is a process, not an event. A process that could be nurtured and gradually grow, provided we did certain things. We didn't have to wait for it to jump out and bite us at some point in the future. Rather, we could cause entry by troops to happen if we just understood that it was a process and we did certain things to nurture it. So, since 1996, I've never seen the House of Justice use the phrase entry by troops without preceding it with the word process. Furthermore, they had added another word, the word advance, as in advance the process of entry by troops. Now, if they had said complete the process of entry by troops, we might still have thought that it was, you know, a quick, sudden thing, okay, because it could be completed. So their choice of the word advance is very deliberate. Had they said also, though, begin the process of entry by troops, that would have been also misleading because it would have implied that the process hadn't begun yet. So the use of the word advance makes it clear that the process was already going. It was just very young and needed nurturing and growth. And so this nurturing and growth of that process began in 1996. It was the single aim of the plan in 1996 and remains the single aim of all the plans during this 25-year period, including the current plan we're in now. Therefore, I'm going to call this big 25-year period the 25-year advance in the process of entry by troops. It's my name for it, okay? <laughs> History will certainly have a name for this period, but I'm going to call it that now just for the sake of discussion. So we began focusing on this process of entry by troops in 1996, and over the last 15 years, we've gradually come to learn what it means and how to advance it. The House of Justice first said that this advance could only be achieved through the development of three distinct components. It was as if advancing the process of entry by troops was a tree which had three main branches. And these three branches are the development of the individual believer, the development of the institutions, and the development of the local community. We need equal and complementary development of all three for the whole process to advance. Think of it like a tripod or a three-legged stool. It won't stand if you, if you take off even one of the legs. It falls down. You need all three legs or it won't stand. So this theme that there are three different components to the plan has been a major theme of the House of Justice for the last 15 years. The plan has three participants, the individual, the institutions, the community. In one place, the House of Justice referred to them as the three constituent participants in the upbuilding of the order of Baha'u'llah. In another, they refer to the three protagonists of the divine plan. In another place, they refer to the three inseparable participants in the evolution of the new world order, and so forth. We're going to discuss the development of all of these three in later sessions. Today, I only want to outline the whole process, and then we'll look at the details later. Once we knew that advancing the process of entry by troops had three main branches, we then found that further branches and twigs were needed on the tree. We needed, according to the House of Justice, a, quote, worldwide effort to develop human resources. We needed a systematic method, they said, for educating large numbers of believers in the fundamental verities of the faith. We needed a way, they said, for Baha'is, both new and veteran alike, a way that they could acquire the knowledge and capacity to sustain a continuous expansion and consolidation of the community. We needed, they said, an evolution that calls for a state of new mind. And so from these kind of statements emerged a complete coherent system, a system that involved training institutes, study circles, other core activities, children's classes, programs for junior youth, devotional gatherings, 
new administrative structures, the division of the Baha'i world into geographic units called clusters, a series of stages through which the clusters advance, three-month cycles, intensive programs of growth, reflection gatherings, many other elements. You're familiar with all of these, right? And we're going to discuss all of these elements in detail in future sessions. But right now, I only want to mention that this is a complete system. It's not just one little thing here and there. It's a complete system. And together, this system, the House of Justice says, is an instrument of limitless potentialities. And they describe the system in many ways. One case, they refer to the system as an educational process to bring about the spiritual empowerment of large numbers. Another place, they refer to the system as a landscape of unfolding processes, emerging structures, and enduring fellowship. In another place, they refer to the system as an ever-expanding, self-sustaining system for the spiritual edification of a population. They said that approach to growth will evolve further in complexity and sophistication and ultimately demonstrate the society-building power inherent in the faith. They didn't just describe the system, which is really quite elaborate. That's just the what, the what we should do. They also describe the how. Not just what we do, but how we do it. And that is a really, really big subject that we're going to need to talk about because it's not just what we're doing, it's how we do it. They refer to the system as having both instruments and methods. So some parts of the system are instruments and other methods. And that's kind of like the what and the how. Now, if you were Baha'i and and you went to sleep, say, just before 1996. Say you went to sleep, and you didn't wake up until today. And you came to your first Baha'i meeting after sleeping for 15 years. I can imagine what that meeting would be like. Okay? You'd walk in, you'd say, Allah Apa, I haven't been around you know, for a while. In fact, I've been asleep for 15 years. And they'd say, well, it's great to see you, and I'm glad you're here, because we're just about to go to a reflection gathering. And you'd say, well, what's a, what's a reflection gathering? Is that where we all look in the mirror or something? And you'd say, they'd say, no, no, it's just we're going to review our three-month cycle and begin a new IPG. And you'd say, what's a PIG? <laughs> and they'd say, no, 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 it's not a PIG. That would be a pig. It's, it's an intensive program of growth. And you'd say, oh, I see. Well, well who's going to be there? Mm, the whole cluster. The whole what? That sounds a little weird. Don't worry, you'll find out. We're just trying to stimulate the core activities. Core activities? I don't understand. Who organized this meeting anyway? The area teaching committee. Huh? Who appointed them? The regional council. The what? Are you sure this is the Baha'i faith spelled B-A-H-A -A apostrophe I? Oh, sure. It's the same faith. You're in the right place. Well, how come I don't understand a word you're saying? Well, that's because just after you went to sleep, the faith went through a turning point of epochal magnitude. <laughs> and you'd say, oh, well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> epochal magnitude, I love that word. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't have gone to sleep for 15 years. And they'd probably say, well, don't worry, some of us have kind of been asleep too. And we're only just catching on. You shouldn't have any problem. So come on, let's go to the meeting. On the way, would you like to read the recent messages of the House of Justice? They're only 68 pages long. <laughs> and you'd say, sure, let me have a look. And they'd drive off into the sunset. You know, it's kind of like the script of some bad Baha'i science fiction movie or something like that. <laughs> In fact, I, I was thinking after reading the house message, if I ever became a rap star, I would name myself Epochal Magnitude. <laughs> that would be what I thought. Or, or maybe I just call myself EPM for short, you know? Yeah. And then I was thinking, if we actually did have a movie about a Baha'i who went to sleep for 15 years, we could maybe make it that they went to sleep exactly on April 21st and then woke up on April 21st, 15 years later. And then we could call the character Riz Von Winkle. But, <laughs> but anyway, 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 don't worry about that. Let's, let's get back to the, anyway, 
the point is, the point is, there's been enormous change in the faith in the last 15 years. You all understand this. And this is what I really like about the 28 December message of the House of Justice, because they review the entire process of the last 15 years. In fact, many of the elements of the whole process, they were only gradually introduced over the last 15 years. The division of the Baha'i world into clusters, for example, occurred in 2001, five years after the start. The designation of junior youth groups as core activity only began in 2005, some nine years, and so on. So the, the system gradually unfolded over the last 15 years. And if we wanted to see the whole system in its entirety, we would have had to compile the information from lots of messages. But the House of Justice did that for us in the 28 December message. In fact, as they surveyed the entire process, they said the vista from this vantage point is stupendous indeed. I like to think of it like this. You don't need to tell a newborn baby everything he's going to go through in life until he's 25. He wouldn't understand it, and even if he did, he doesn't need to know. It would just confuse him. But at some point in the life of a person, they reach an age where they can see where their life has been and where it's going to head. And I like to think of this as the age of maturity, the age of 15. A 15-year-old has the maturity to understand his life, and he knows he still has more to develop, but he can kind of see his future. And it so happens that the 28 December message that came from the House of Justice came exactly 15 years after the beginning of the process. So I like to think that the 25-year process has reached the age of maturity. And if that's true, that means we have the most exciting 10 years ahead of us. You know, the stage in which you can really build on your development and see the fruition and powers and abilities and see everything steadily advancing. And that really is the impression I get from the 28 December message. They say that the growth and development of the faith that we've nurtured over the last 15 years is going to advance and mature during these coming years beyond anything previously experienced. Now, we're going to discuss all of these things, the whole plan. We're going to talk about it in great detail during this course. But this morning, I just want to talk about one sentence, one phrase in the 28 December message. I want to kind of look at the forest before we examine the trees. And that phrase, the House of Justice says, a review of the process that unfolds in a cluster will serve to underscore its fundamentally organic nature. That's interesting, isn't it? that it's fundamentally organic in nature. Because the House of Justice is comparing this big system that we're going to talk about. They're comparing the whole system to the growth of life, to organic growth. So if we examine the principles of organic growth and compare it to the system that the House of Justice is describing, maybe we can get a better idea. So let's do that. Let's examine the principles of organic growth and compare them to this system we're building. The first and most basic principle of organic life, as I see it, and as Al-Dubaha has also pointed out, is that there is some mysterious force of attraction, one could even say a force of love, that binds together living organisms. Think about your own body. It's made up of common elements that exist throughout the universe. You know this. In fact, the entire universe itself is made up of only 92 natural elements. But somehow, they all kind of combine and these natural elements make the universe. Now, how these elements combine and bond with each other is absolutely fascinating. I wish we could go into that. But just think about your own body. It's made up of just 12 elements. They're all common in the universe. In fact, 99% of your body is made up of just six elements. Just six elements. That's oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, and so on. Okay, how did these elements just kind of decide to get together and make up your body? How do they do that? They're all over the place in the universe and they just kind of decide, okay, I'm going to come together and hang together and be your body. It seems like a mystery, doesn't it? It's the mystery of organic life, which has the power to unite simple elements into complex structures. I want you to think of several words as being interchangeable. And these words are unity, love, attraction, cohesion, and life. In other words, life is love, and love is life. Life is unity, unity is life, and so on. Adibaha explains this in one passage. He says, love 
is the most great law that ruleth this mighty and heavenly cycle. The unique power that bindeth together the diverse elements of this material world. The supreme magnetic force that directeth the movements of the spheres in the celestial realms. Love revealeth with unfailing and limitless power the mysteries latent in the universe. Love is the spirit of life unto the adorned body of mankind. Now I learned something about this from my cat, believe it or not, from my cat. I had this great cat and I love the cat and she lived to be 17 years old which is quite old for a cat as you, as you know. She got so frail that she lost her meow and she went <laughs> like that. <laughs> and she couldn't even jump up on my lap from the floor to the couch when I was sitting down. And then one day I looked around and she was not there. And the next morning I went outside and I saw her sleeping peacefully under her favorite tree. But she had passed away, just peacefully passed away. So I got a shovel and I prepared to, to bury her. And when I turned her over, I had found that underneath she had completely rotted away. Her skin and fur had already completely decomposed. And I thought to myself, this is really strange. Just a day or two ago, all of her atoms were holding together. They were all clinging together. And now today she has exactly those same atoms, but they're all falling apart. I said, well, what is this thing called life? That when you have it, there's unity and cohesion. And when you don't have it, everything just falls apart. And this is what it is. Unity is life. Life is unity. Love is unity. Unity is love and so on. And if you think about any form of unity, I want you to think about it as life itself. A united family has a life. A united workplace has a life. A united marriage has a life. A united community has a life. Even cities and nations of the whole world. Whenever there's love and unity, it's like a form of life. Likewise, where there's disunity, we should think of that as a death. A family that's disunited is like a death. If we see a marriage that's falling apart, it's like a death is taking place. A disunited community or cities or nations, they're all a form of death that can only result in disintegration. Now when I read the House of Justice, the way they describe the importance of unity and fellowship in relation to the plan, it really seems like they're calling on us to create life itself in our communities. They speak of the spirit of unity that must animate the friends, the ties of love that must bind them. They talk about an emergent community spirit which becomes evident when we carry out our programs of growth. They speak of the spirit of fellowship that the institute process creates and so forth. In these and in many other statements, I find that the House of Justice is calling on us to create a whole new life form the life of the community. So this is the first principle of organic growth that I find parallel to the plan that we're building. The second principle of organic life is that life grows and evolves in a steady process. Life doesn't just pop into existence fully formed, not in plants, not in animals, not in humans. And because we understand life to be a process we don't judge something in its early stages, thinking it will remain in its primitive state. We're conscious of the fact that it's going to grow and evolve. We look at a tiny bud and we know it will be a flower. We look at a seed, we know it will be a tree. Because we know that life is a process of growth, even small milestones have meaning to us because we can see where the process is going. Think about something as simple as a baby taking its first steps. If we didn't view this as a process, it would appear to be a fairly inconsequential event, wouldn't it? Okay, the baby just takes one step, awkwardly stumbles and falls flat on his face. Okay. But we treat it like it's the greatest thing in the world. You know, we get out the video camera and we record it and we post it on YouTube and Facebook and we bore all our friends and tell them about it, you know. We don't dwell on the fact that the baby fell flat on his face because we know that as sure as he took that one step, tomorrow he's going to take two. And then sooner or later he's going to be running and he's going to be doing all kinds of things and borrowing the keys to your car and, you know, everything else. 
We understand the process. That first step is a milestone, and we see significance in it. We have confidence in the process of growth. And this is how we need to view the activities of the five-year plan. Our core activities, our teaching endeavors, our administrative work, all of them are alive and growing. And their future is far greater than what we may see today. But we know this. The House of Justice said this. They said, discrete actions are placed in context, and even the smallest of steps is endowed with meaning. If we think about the purpose of the plan, that we're not just having a few happy little meetings here, we're literally transforming the world, then we will see our actions in context and small steps will have meaning. As we're driving to a study circle or going to a reflection gathering or making a home visit, we won't be tempted to think that there's something else we could be doing that's more important. And that is a temptation, isn't it? If we don't have an organic perspective, it's easy to think that there's something bigger and better, more exciting that you could be doing tonight than this little meeting you're going to. Maybe there's some blockbuster movie you want to see or some concert you want to go to or sporting event where thousands of people are attending. The world is full of distractions which claim to be the most important thing, something you supposedly can't afford to miss. But with the right perspective, we won't succumb to this illusion. When you go to work on Monday and your friends say to you, they went to this huge concert or this great party or a big football game or whatever, and then you ask them, and they ask you, say, what did you do on the weekend? And you can say, hmm, just saving human civilization. <laughs> you know, in my spare time. You know. <laughs> so another principle of organic life is that we see it as a long-term process and we have faith in where it's going. Now, another characteristic of organic life that I see in relation to the plan is that organic life, all life, grows by meeting challenges and it's constantly struggling against forces that oppose it. If you study science and biology, you'll find that life cannot grow without struggling against opposing forces. This struggle causes living organisms to evolve and adapt and acquire new abilities. Without struggle against opposing forces, there would be no growth in life. Problems and obstacles are an essential part of the life process, impelling it forward. Speaking about the plan, the House of Justice writes, progress is achieved through the dialectic of crises and victory, and setbacks are inevitable. A drop in participation, a disruption in cycles of activity, a momentary breach in the bonds of unity. These are among the myriad challenges that may have to be met. Now, this is very interesting because a living organism is always evolving. We'd have to agree that, right? A human adult doesn't look like a big 200 pound baby, does it? Okay, a, an oak tree doesn't look like a 500 pound acorn. Okay, because organic growth doesn't just mean an increase in size. It also means a change in form. You'd have to agree, is that right? When you encounter problems, when you encounter problems, we should understand that we can meet these problems and these challenges by thinking organically. Now, what do I mean by thinking organically? Say, for example, you encounter certain problems that the House of Justice has identified. They say a drop in participation, a disruption in the cycles of activity, a momentary breach in the bonds of unity. Have any of you experienced any problems? in the plan. We can overcome these by understanding that life grows by problems and meeting them and challenging them. If we encounter them, we should think about how life grows by becoming stronger by meeting challenges. If something is not working today that was doing fine a few years ago, we might be tempted to just keep doing the same thing that's now no longer working. Humans can be like that. You know, we like to keep doing the same things the same way and we don't like change. But sometimes when we do that, we're just trying to make a bigger baby, so to speak. Okay, if you understand what I mean. Problems and challenges are meant to force us to evolve and to acquire new abilities. Abilities that we didn't have or even necessarily need in before. This is what I think is what is meant by organic growth. Organic growth evolves, it changes, it meets, it adapts. So this is another principle of organic life. That it, it overcomes obstacles and challenges, and this is the way it grows. 
Another closely related characteristic to organic life that I find related to the plan is that life is able to adapt to specific environments. Living organisms seem to have an inbuilt intelligence to modify themselves to suit their own peculiar circumstances and conditions. Charles Darwin realized this when he visited the Galapagos Islands in the 1830s and he examined different kinds of one species of bird, the finch. And he found that the finches on different islands were all of the same species, but on each island they had a different kind of beak. Some had a long pointed beak and some had a short strong beak and some were vegetarians and some ate worms and so on. And he was puzzled by this at first, but then he realized that the beak of each bird on each island was exactly suited to the food source on that island. Some needed to dig deep into the sand and others needed to break hard shells and so on. And this was an important realization about the nature of life, that it adapts and evolves whenever necessary to suit the conditions of its own environment. And I see similarities in the way the House of Justice describes how we should approach our planning in our own communities. They write, while the friends in a cluster might well benefit from the experience of those who have already established the necessary pattern of action, it is only through continued action, reflection, and consultation on their part that they will learn to read their own reality, see their own possibilities, make use of their own resources, and respond to the exigencies of large-scale expansion and consolidation. So we can't just say such and such worked in another cluster, so let's do it here. That'd be kind of like birds going to a new island and saying, oh, you know, long pointed beaks worked on the other island, so let's not change our beaks. And they'd all starve to death. Okay, so organic life adapts itself according to its own methods. And of course, in science, we know those methods are natural selection. It happens without free will. But if we want to apply this principle of life to our communities, we have to consciously do it. And the House of Justice says that the way you consciously apply this principle is through what they call continued action, reflection, and consultation. And of course, we also need to know when it's good to change and adapt and when it's actually better to keep persevering with the same thing. And we have guidance from the institutions on this, on this but initially it's through our own action, reflection, and consultation that will enable us to incorporate this principle into our activities. Now yet another principle of organic life that I find that's similar to this plan is that organic life builds complete complex organisms, complex systems. And they're coherent systems. Now the word coherent is important. The House of Justice has used this term frequently in the last 15 years. Coherent, coherence, coherently. You've probably read this all over the House of Justice messages. Now, I know that we're not supposed to dwell on words. We're supposed to think in complete concepts. But when I found the House of Justice employing this word so often, I decided to look it up just to make sure I understood exactly what was meant. And I found that the root of the word, here, it means to stick together. But there are many words that have this same root, adhere, cohere, inherent, and so on. There's many words. But there's an important distinction to each of these words. Adhere, it means that one thing sticks to the other. So that one thing is a sticker and the other thing is a sticky. You see, that's what adhere means. Okay, inherent means that one thing is stuck inside the other. But coherent, adding the prefix co, means that the two things are equally sticking to each other. Coherence implies a mutual interdependence. Coherent relationships are those where the elements are equally important and even depend on each other for the whole system to function. A living organism, like the human body, is a coherent system. You'll never hear doctors arguing about what's more important, the heart or the liver or the brain or the lungs or whatever. They're all equally important. Without any one of them, the rest of them would not survive. Each do different things, they all have their own job, but together they form a coherent system. Likewise, doctors know that the health of one part of the body might be affected by the health of some other part. A problem in, say, the stomach might not be addressed 
by focusing only on the stomach. Perhaps you have to look at the heart or the liver or some other part. In the same way, the House of Justice describes all of the elements of this plan that we're going to discuss. They describe that every part of the plan is part of a big coherent system, a living system. They speak of the coherence needed between expansion and consolidation. They speak of the coherence of all the core activities, the study circles, the children's classes, devotional gatherings, and so on. They say we must employ the instruments and methods of the plan with a high degree of coherence. They refer to the coherence between the material and spiritual requirements of life. They talk about the relationship between all the institutions, the assemblies, the board members, the regional councils, the area teaching committee, and they say that these institutions must relate to each other coherently. They talk about the three protagonists of the plan, the individual, the institutions, the community, as being part of a coherent system. They're interdependent. Each depends on the health and development of the other. The individual cannot progress without the maturation and development of the institutions, but the institutions will get nowhere without the spiritual development of the individual. And the community needs spiritual individuals and mature institutions and so on. So the principle of coherence is yet another characteristic of organic life that we find in the plan. I see another parallel between the plan and the growth of human life in the way the House of Justice uses the term systematic. We're asked to be systematic in relation to many aspects of the plan. In particular, I'm interested in the introduction of training institutes or study circles as a method intended to bring a systematic approach to learning, developing our spiritual capacities and training us for action. We understand the value of systematic training in other areas of life. For example, if you went to have brain surgery and the doctor said to you he didn't have a medical degree, okay, he said he's just always been naturally talented and he's interested, okay, <laughs> you'd probably say, you know, I, I'm not going to go ahead with the surgery because it doesn't matter how gifted or naturally talented the man might be, you just kind of prefer to have your brain cut open by someone who's undergone a system, a systematic course of training. Likewise, if you got on a commercial jetliner and you saw the pilot was reading a book entitled, Even You Can Fly a 747, <laughs> or something like that, you'd probably just turn around and get off the plane. You just, you kind of prefer that your pilot has gone through a systematic course. Isn't that right? We understand this. In my profession of music, I often meet people who have natural gifts. They're naturally gifted, but they fail to realize their potential by not systematically training. And then I come across others who, because they went through systematic training, they end up surpassing those who appear to have the talent to begin with. In fact, we may never really know who has the actual innate talent and who just had the discipline and the dedication to carry out systematic training. A woman once said to the great violinist Fritz Kreisler, she said, I would give my life to be able to play like you. And he said, Madam, I did. You see, so the point is, is that we all know that systematic training is valuable in many areas of life. Perhaps to some people, systematic study might seem slow or boring at first if they think they're already ahead of the game but we know that systematic training ends up winning in the end, just like the tortoise over the hare. But the thought occurred to me, if systematic learning is so valuable, why weren't we doing this all along in the faith? Why did it start in 1996? And I found the answer in the Red Swan message of 2010. And the House of Justice wrote this. They said, when in December 1995, we called for the establishment of training institutes worldwide, the pattern most prevalent in the Baha'i community for helping individual believers to deepen their knowledge in the faith consisted principally of occasional courses and classes of varying durations addressing a variety of subjects. That pattern had satisfied well the needs of an emerging community worldwide. So it was okay. That pattern satisfied the needs. They said, still relatively few in number and concerned chiefly with its geographic spread across the globe. We made clear at that time, however, that another approach to the study of the writings would have to take shape 
one that would spur large numbers into the field of action if the process of entry by troops was to accelerate. So in the past, less formal methods of study were appropriate because we needed to focus on other things at that stage. Now, beginning in 1996, it was time to begin systematic training. Now, as soon as I read this, I thought about the development of a human being. As you know, in the early years of our lives, we learn informally. You don't take a newborn baby and say, here are 10 verbs for you to learn today and here's how you conjugate them. No, you just let the baby naturally absorb however much uh, he or she can learn. And you have to admit that this method, the child learns a tremendous amount about the world and life and language and everything. But there comes a time, usually around the age of five, when this informal method of learning will no longer take the child much further. And so we enroll them in school. They begin a new stage in life where learning becomes systematic. If children do not move to this stage, if we don't put them in school, they won't advance in life. That turning point is a huge milestone in the life of a child. Maybe you remember your first day at school, or perhaps you remember taking and leaving your children at school for the very first time. It's a beautiful moment, but it's not without some fear or sadness, you know, it's, it's strange. Our little baby is growing up, you say to yourself, and you watch them leave and walk off, and you realize that things are never going to be the same. But that's a part of life, we get used to it. You can't force them to be a baby forever. And so in 1996, the Baha'i world entered the stage of systematic learning. We're growing up now. We're in school now. We can't say, I like the old ways of doing things. I want to be a baby for the rest of my life. Because the nature of life is that it advances into new stages. How much time do I have? I don't have much more time, is that right? I've got two minutes. Well, I had a lot more to say, but I guess I'm not going to say it. Um, Tell you what, we'll just continue tomorrow with, with the, the organic process. But I just want to tell you what we're going to do for the next three days. I sat down, I read all the messages of the house, and I, I sat down and I wrote notes, and I made a program on the five-year plan. And the program takes approximately eight sessions. Okay, it's about eight hours worth of material. So I'm going to get through as much of the material as we can in the first uh, three, three days. Now, even if I just read those messages out loud, it takes more than, than the time we have. So you understand this. But the other sessions, the other five or six sessions, if you want to hear them, I can make them available to you because I'm, I'm giving the whole course in other places and I can have tapes. So sometimes I'm going to refer to what we're going to study and you may not hear it this weekend, but it will be available to you, the course, because this is a very, very important subject. It's very exciting, it's very thrilling. We'll continue with organic process and tomorrow we're gonna to talk about, called the twofold mission of the five-year plan. And I'll tell you what that means tomorrow. So thank you all very much, look forward to seeing you.